Hi, everybody. Andres Kutsia here. I um, just want to check in and say hi and thank you. And sorry that I was absent up until now. And I will also not be able to stay for the whole meeting because meetings are never ending on this end also. But thank you for doing this, um, everybody. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we're just going to wait another minute or two for more attendees to log in. It seems like we've got people starting to really come in now. So in a couple minutes, we'll get we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we're going to go ahead and get started, and uh, we'll have people coming in, I'm sure, as we go, but uh, let's get this rolling. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our October 2021 Meet the Authors webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to viewers within a few days after the webinar has concluded through the LSA website. Today's webinar will be focused on the research of Gerd Carling, or Yerd Carling, sorry, and Chandra Cathcart as they discuss their paper, Reconstructing the Evolution of Indo-European Grammar, which was recently featured in the September issue of the LSA's Language Journal. We will have this brief introduction, followed by about 45 minutes of presentation, and then we will open things up for Q&A. Today's Q&A will be all via typed questions. Please submit any questions you have in the questions box, and we will field them during the Q&A period. This study presents a new model to reconstruct the grammar of the 6,500 to 7,000 year old Proto-Indo-European language, enabling an observation of the evolutionary dynamics of grammar over time and confirms that Proto-Indo-European was a language rich in grammatical categories. So a little bit about our presenters before we get started. Um, Jörg Karling is a associate professor at the Center for Languages and Literature at Lund University. Her research focuses on language reconstruction, in particular, how the ancient and cultural can be used for studying language evolution and change. She has written several monographs, including dictionaries and grammars on Romani and Tokarian, and compiled an atlas on the lexical and grammatical typology of Eurasia from a cultural perspective. She has founded the Die ACL database and lab, an infrastructure for reconstructing prehistoric languages by computational models and harboring data from hundreds of languages. Chandra Cathcart is a senior researcher in the Department of Comparative Language Science at the University of Zurich. His research interests revolve around language change, in particular sound change and morphological change. His work uses a wide range of quantitative and computational tools in order to explore the different pressures that drive the diversification and differentiation of related languages, including phylogenetic models from computational biology, as well as deep learning methods. And with that, I will turn things over to Yurd and Chandra. Enjoy. 
Thank you very much. And um, uh, I would like to start by thanking you to inviting us here to give this webinar. So it's an honor. Uh, so I hope you can see my uh, presentation, my screen here. It says uh, reconstructing the evolution of Indo-PN grammar. So let's start simple. For the current paper, we have had two basic research questions. So first, can we reconstruct grammatical systems of languages in the past? And second, can we use these reconstructions to observe how languages evolve? These questions are not new. Rather, they have been central in linguistic studies, in historical linguistic studies, for more than 100 years. To understand the context of our study, we will begin this presentation with some very brief background. In the, light, in the late 18th century, uh, William Jones discovered the similarity between Sanskrit and ancient European languages and suggested that these similarities were caused by a joint ancestral language which uh, was then protein European. This led to the discovery of the genealogical classification of languages, which among others formed the basis for the theory of evolution. The classification and reconstruction of a proto-language was further developed by German and Danish scholars in the early 19th century, leading to the establishment of the Indo-European family. And after that, several many other families. The German scholar August Fleischer drafted the first cladistic tree of Indo-European and created a highly durable model for classification, namely the tree model. Around the turn of the century, the so-called neogrammarians in Leipzig became highly influential. Based on the structure of the ancient languages Sanskrit, Greek, Latin and Gothic, they reconstructed a complete grammar system for the Proto-Indopean language. They reconstructed the Proto-language basically using Sanskrit as a template, a highly synthetic language um, with lots of categories. However, the discovery of Hittite and the Anatolian branch in the early 20th century led scholars to question this Sanskrit-based reconstruction. Anatolian was much older than the other previously known Indo-European languages, but it was substantially different in its structural setup. Anatolian had few grammatical categories and it showed ergative as well as agglutinating tendencies. This led to a revision of the a classical neogrammarian uh, neo model of reconstruction. Besides Anatolian, another Indo-European language showed up in the early 20th century, namely Tocharian. Uh, Tocharian was of course attested much later than Anatolian, but it, it turned out to, to form its different branch and it was rich in forms and categories. However, it was mixed agglutinating synthetic and it had apparently undergone a breakdown and rebuilding of almost entire grammar. Questions concerning the structure of protein European emerged already before the discovery of Anatolian. Based on paradigmatic contrasts in the proto-language, uh, C.C. Ulenbeck uh, at Leiden University suggested that Indo-European could have been an ergative language already in 1901. Ullenbeck also suggested that Indo-European was a mixed language with different origins of vocabulary and grammar. He believed that the comparative method only could reconstruct vocabulary, not grammar. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, alternative theories. Uh, are sometimes connected to the location of the homeland. The most important aspect is nearness to the Caucasian language families, which exhibit ergative and active stative typology. And uh, these are important, for instance, in the models by Ulenbeck and Gamkelis and Ivanov. However, another model was suggested by Hermann Hirt who locates the proto-homeland along the Baltic Sea, 
but he reconstructs a proto-language lacking grammatical categories completely. So to sum up uh, the controversies of the 20th century during uh, Indo-European, they concern time depth, they concern the grammar structure, and they concern also the family tree. So there is the canonical model, which reconstructs a synthetic system, a full setup of variable categories, and a full case system. Uh, and then there is the ergative model, which reconstructs an ergative system on nouns and verbs, basically. And then there is the active stative model, which reconstructs the active stative marking on nouns and verbs, fewer categories of verbs, and fewer number of cases. And as for the family tree, there is the Indo-Anatolian tree, and then there is the Indo-Anatolian Tocharian tree, and another tree where all branches split up simultaneously. And then there are different time depths, uh, uh, one uh, which reconstructs like a 6,000 year old proto-language, and another one which reconstructs an um, older proto-language. So, the most important arguments for the alternative models are uh, in grammar are the, the absence of a lexical root for have in Indo-European, and then a distinction of animate and inanimate in the nominal and pronominal paradigm, an unmarked subject against a marked object, the occurrence of oblique subjects in the proto-language, a binary verbal paradigm, as in the tight, and then possible alienable inalienable position and exclusive uh, inclusive pronouns. So these are all reconstructed features of the proto-language based on the comparative method. Then uh, there is another further controversy which arose as a result of Greenberg's typological model in the 1960s. The basic idea was that a reconstructed proto-language would be consistent in, uh, for instance, word order harmonies. And a problem was uh, here, the relative clause linking in ancient languages, which is inconsistent. And this led to two different positions for whether indo -PM was left branching or right branching. So there are, <clears throat> to sum up, several unsolved mysteries concerning protein European grammar, where it's obvious that the comparative method cannot give a complete answer. For instance, what was the dominant typological structure of protein European? Synthetic, agglutinating, isolating. Was protein European a complex language, many categories, or a language with fewer categories, such as Anatolian? What was the structure of the indo -PN family tree? What was the indo -PN dominant word order? What happened to the protein European language in the different branches of the tree? And that depends a bit on what you reconstruct for the proto-language. And what was the general tendency of change from the proto-language via the branches into present day? And again, that depends on what type of system you reconstruct. And then, of course, what was the dynamics of change of various categories of grammar? So just to draft the most important models, as I already mentioned, model one uh, has an Indo-Anatolian tree with an ergative and active stative proto-language, which is then preserved in uh, Anatolian. And then all other languages develop a synthetic and form-rich system, which was then lost in branches. This model requires a relatively swift transfer from the active stative or ergative language to a form simple system uh, in, in the, the branches. To a form rich system and then a form simple system, sorry. A second model assumes a form rich and synthetic proto language in which many categories were lost in Anatolian and then gradually decreasing and eroding in the branches. So it's then a bit simpler model. A variant of model two assumes a form rich and synthetic proto language which is then uh, gradually eroding. However, this model assumes that Tocharian did split off second uh, before the other branches. So it's the Tocharian second model. And then we have another model, a third model, that assumes a synthetic or and form-rich proto-language, but does not deal with a specific sub-branching. And according to this model, 
all branches of Indo-PN split off simultaneously and then they preserved or uh, eroded uh, in different ways. The main aims of the current study can be summarized as follows. To compile Indo-PN MOF syntactic and typological data, including the domains of previous reconstructions, to use the typological coding that um, enables a comparison of living and extinct languages, to infer a family tree that represents the consensus concerning branching and time depth, and to adapt a comparative phylogenetic model that reconstructs probabilities of presence at hidden nodes, as well as transition rates between nodes, and then to contrast the results to various reconstructions of the protein European language. So these are the targeted domains, and without going too much into detail, we compile word order, alignment structure, nominal morphology, and verbal morphology. And we differentiate at positions, known adjective, noun relative, WH element, main clause, subnormal clause, infinitive, participle, and clitic pronouns. For alignment, we look at nouns and pronouns in simple past and in present progressive, as well as verbs and reflexive pronouns. Nominal morphology is case, pronouns, gender, definiteness, and propositional agreement. Verbal morphology is simple past concord, present progressive concord, future tense, and continuous present typology. So that's basically what we have in the data. So just to give some examples, the, for word order, we'll uh, look at dominant word order for the various types. And for the uh, domain of alignment, we look at dominant alignment in different categories of grammar, as I said before, in simple past and in uh, present progressive and with verbs. So uh, we have uh, uh, nominative accusative marking, no marking, uh, active stative marking, and ergative, basically. And for nominal morphology, we look at nominal case, pronominal case, gender, definiteness, and also prepositional agreement. And uh, the focus in verbal morphology is verbal agreement or person concord. Uh, uh, in person, number, gender, and also verbal typology. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> the day we use basically a um, hierarchical scheme, uh, which includes questions uh, then, like here, and they can be asked to native speakers or to grammars or corpora for dead languages. And these features also allow for dimorphic coding. And uh, at, in the database, they come out as binary features. So this is the basic structure. And uh, this is the database where it's stored. And the database design matches the hierarchical uh, feature design, as you can see here. And thereupon, this is the lowest level, the binary level of the data. And uh, we take the we extract the data from the database, and we take the lowest level, the the binarized level of the data, extract that, uh, and we recode that. So uh, we recode that into multi-state characters that have several variants. And this is methodologically important, and Chandra will talk more about that like later, how it's used uh, to set up the model. So you can see that we, we take these features, we recode them, and then we have these multi-state features with traits. And we call them, um, we give them names, like noun, present, progressive, type, tripartite, noun, present, progressive, nominative, accusative, and so forth. And these, uh, we call them then features or variables and traits values. So these are the traits or values that we actually uh, measure. So just very briefly to look at the data numbers, we have 125 languages, three archaic languages, uh, five ancient languages, 29 medieval languages, 79 modern languages, and nine Romani varieties. 
we have 108 binary features that we have recoded into 65 categorical features or multi-state features uh, with uh, uh, several number of variants. And this is a map of the data, sorry that it's a bit uh, bad, but it shows the distribution. So we cover the entire Indo-European area. So um, to assess the evolutionary dynamics of traits, which is another thing that we do, I will tell you why in a minute. We adapt a coding which contrasts traits in pairs, representing one uh, unmarked or more frequent, and versus one marked and less frequent category. And this we do for uh, all features uh, present in our data, except for word order, because we didn't want to enter into the discussions with concerning word order and uh, hierarchies. Another uh, coding uh, is that we uh, code, we select three representative grammars to code the three basic models of reconstruction for protein the PN. And um, we select these three descriptions because they were uh, give complete descriptions of all or include all the features that we have in our data. And then we uh, use these three models, the canonical model, the active stating model, and the isolating model. And uh, for that, we select these three publications, Brugman and Delbrick, 1901, uh, Hirt, uh, 1935, and Gamke, Litzen, and Ivanov, uh, 1984. And then we code our comparative reconstructions as languages of the database. And thereupon, we recode the bin binary features as the data of that tested language. So that's basically the procedure we use. Okay, so now I will leave over to Chandra to talk about how we constructed a consensus tree of protein European. Please. Sure. Uh, thank you, Yad. Um, so to uh, shed light on the questions of interest to this paper, we turn to quantitative methods. Um, we specifically employed methodologies used in a uh, sort of field of computational biology known as phylogenetic comparative methods. Phylogenetic comparative methods are a broad family of tools designed to investigate diversity and diversification among related biological organisms, or in our case, languages, while accounting for phylogenetic relatedness and other uh, potential nuisance factors of that sort. The key ingredient in any uh, methodology from phylogenetic comparative methods is, um, as you might expect, a phylogenetic representation of the languages or organisms in question. Um, so we uh, developed a phylogenetic representation of our languages that incorporated some degree of phylogenetic uncertainty. Um, trees are not a gold standard, um, so we have to potentially account for um, some unknowns. What we did was to um, settle on a topology that essentially was compatible with recently published trees, uh, such as Shang 2015, and we implemented chronological uncertainty by sampling dates for internal nodes of the tree from chronological ranges compatible with phonology, uh, with uh, topo phy sorry, phylogenies like Chang et al., uh, as well as inferences based on the archaeological record. So this results in a sample of several hundred trees that vary in terms of dating. And this tree sample is uh, an essential ingredient uh, and uh, prerequisite for the sort of quantitative modeling that we wished to do. Next slide. Yes. So the model that we used is a fairly standard uh, model of evolution for categorical features. Um, it is uh, basically adopted almost wholesale from uh, computational biology. And this is the continuous time Markov model of feature evolution or character evolution. And it 
rests on one fairly basic assumption, and that is that the linguistic variable in question or variables in question change according to so-called evolutionary rates, which can be estimated from a set of basically a vector of linguistic data and a sample, some sort of phylogenetic representation. So uh, these rates uh, have to be basically inferred from the data. Um, so as you can see in this little schema, the arrows represent potential transitions between different word or order types that we have in our database. And the actual um, chronology governing transitions represented by the arrows is something we don't know. It's something that this particular model of evolution uh, allows us to estimate. Um, rates can be used to reconstruct the probability of occurrence of a feature at internal nodes of the tree. So this is really central to our major objective, which is to try to do quantitative reconstruction of linguistic features to Proto-Indo-European. Um, the Proto-Indo-European is essentially the root of our tree, and that is where we want to sort of know uh, the probability of a certain feature existing, like a certain type of word order. Um, and the rates can also be used to um, address a number of really interesting questions about featural stability and instability and so on and so forth. Um, so we carried out inference using RSTAN, a very powerful and uh, convenient probabilistic programming language. And all of our code is available in two repositories uh, linked to in the paper. The reason that we used RSTAN was uh, because it gave us a bit, uh, uh, sort of a higher degree of flexibility than your standard off the shelf tools from computational biology. Uh, the details are somewhat technical in nature, so I won't go into too much detail about them here. Uh, but one major question uh, involved how to treat the so-called root prior, um, which is uh, something that really influences the type of reconstructions that you get at the root of the tree. There's a standard convention in biology regarding how to set this value, but we weren't certain that it was appropriate for uh, linguistic questions, so we played around with this value and also tried to treat it as an unknown parameter. Um, all of the details of this uh, inference are in the supplementary material of the paper. And we found that it does make uh, some degree of difference, but wasn't ultimately that uh, uh, big a source of confusion when it came to actually addressing the concrete results of our inference procedure that, that were of interest to the major research questions of this paper. Another thing that we did uh, was to do leave one out cross-validation. Uh, this was suggested by a reviewer and it was uh, sort of made me groan a bit, but I'm ultimately glad that we did it. Uh, one reason is that um, there's a lot of skepticism about methods of this sort. Um, the methods are great, assuming that the model of language change is actually correct and valid. Um, and it's very difficult to evaluate uh, the validity of reconstructions because uh, reconstructions are a hypothesis. There's rarely a gold standard or ground truth reconstruction of Proto-Indo-European. So what we did was we held out individual languages in our tree and tried to predict their data on the basis of our quantitative model. And uh, we found that actually the model usually does pretty well. There is sort of a difference in uh, performance across ancestral languages like Latin or Sanskrit or classical Greek and contemporary languages um, like Spanish or Hindi. Uh, but these um, accuracy values tend to be fairly high. The median for ancestral languages is in the high uh, 90s, it, roughly 97.5% uh, accuracy is the median. The mean is a little lower, um, somewhere in the upper 80s, and the median is slightly lower for contemporary languages in the upper 80 range. Um, so this was, uh, I mean, leave one out cross-validation is most valuable when you are um, doing comparison between multiple statistical models, and that's not something we're doing here. But it nonetheless was a pleasant sanity check that demonstrated that there is um, something to this uh, way of looking at language change. Oops. 
Uh, okay, so I will take over here and just say uh, a few words about what uh, the results actually were. So, <clears throat> we uh, the, re the reconstruction gave us for world order uh, post positions. So we talk about the proto language, proto Indo-European post positions, adjective noun world order, noun relative clause world order, WH initial order, main clause SOV, subordinate clause SOV and then infinitive participle and clitic pronoun clause uh, OV. For alignment structure, it was not very, uh, you know, very interesting, or it was just nominative accusative everywhere. For nominal morphology, uh, we had between seven and six cases, six and seven cases with synthetic structure, and it reconstructed masculine, feminine, and neuter predicative gender agreement, and no definiteness. And for uh, verbal morphology, full agreement in present tense, syncretic agreement in past tense, and synthetic present progressive, and no future. So, when we compare that uh, to the coding of the schools, uh, we see that there is one very obvious and clear winner. And this plot uh, visualizes the results of the three main models, the active stative model here, or uh, and the canonical model, the neogrammarian model, and the isolating model by Hirt. So here is Gamke Lidze, here is Brogman, Delbrück, and here is Hirt. Higher values signify greater agreement. So it's quite clear uh, that uh, the winner is the canonical model outlined already in 19th century. Uh, however, the alternative models both score relatively well uh, since they agree in other domains than they like the important domains such as alignment. Uh, so they uh, agree, for instance, in word order, uh, absence of future and definiteness, and um, uh, however, they mismatch in alignment, structure, case, gender, and verbal agreement, which makes the canonical model by Brugman uh, into a clear winner. And then uh, uh, a noteworthy result is the higher probability for a three gender system compared to a two gender system. In Indian reconstruction, there is a consensus on reconstructing a two gender system due to the fact that Anatolian doesn't have, have a feminine gender, it has only a communion neuter. As you can see from these pie chart diagrams, the model finds it's more likely that Anatolian lost the feminine than that all the other languages achieved uh, a three gender system. And Chandra, yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I guess it's necessary to sort of embark on a, a short um, excursus uh, right now, which the, the webinar gives us the opportunity to do. Um, so it goes without saying that this result is a bit controversial. And uh, we feel that it definitely should be approached with a, a bit of delicacy, we don't want to give the impression that we're um, thumbing our nose at the long, uh, very careful literature on, on uh, morphological reconstruction of gender in uh, Indo-European. Um, and uh, we re regret not having more space to engage with this in, in the actual draft of the paper. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the situation is highly, highly complex. The um, the actual, when you look at the different inflectional classes and the evidence for them in Anatolian and Tocharian and other old Indo-European languages, um, the, the situation is essentially so complex that we can kind of, to some extent, reconcile our finding, I believe, with the, the commun communis opinio. So in languages like Sanskrit and Greek and um, you know the sort of non-Tocharian, non-Anatolian ancient Indo-European languages, there are multiple feminine inflectional classes. Um, a number of these are just absent in Anatolian. Uh, their cognates are there, but with not serving as a dedicated feminine. Interestingly enough, uh, Lycian, which we don't have in our data set, does exhibit feminine agreement to some degree, but this is thought to be a later innovation. If I understand correctly, my, my uh, comparative Indo-European days are long, long behind me, so I, I apologize if I'm, I'm speaking uh, er, in uh, error. Uh, so Anatolian does not give evidence for 
for feminine, and there are some morphological mismatches between Tocharian and uh, other non-Anatolian ancient Indo-European languages, which make it seem like Tocharian, while it had a feminine gender, it might have developed some of these feminine inflectional classes independently. Uh, but at the same time, there is at least one shared feminine between Tocharian and other non-Anatolian languages. Um, this is essentially the, the feminine that most likely evolved from uh, suffix of appurtenance. Um, and I don't think it is a massive stretch to envision a scenario where um, appurtenance developed to feminine well within the history of, of pre-Proto-Indo-European or Proto-Indo-European, and then was just simply lost in Anatolian. Um, ultimately, uh, this is something we need to discuss in a little closer detail with our Indo-Europeanist uh, colleagues to, to figure out why there is a discrepancy and if there is actually, in fact, a discrepancy here. Um, because as I mentioned, the feminine inflectional classes are so diverse in uh, ancient Indo-European languages that it, it seems to me possible that at least one of them could have been uh, ancestral to all languages and then just lost by Anatolian. Ultimately, our result here um, in no way bears on the uh, validity of these morphological reconstructions carried out in sort of traditional comparative work. Excurs is over. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, if we look at alignment, uh, the reconstruction gives a nominative accusative structure for the proto language uh, in all instances. Uh, however, neutral marking and negativity or tripartivity, uh, tripartite system is found at lower probabilities with nouns and in simple past, and as you can see here. And uh, uh, that you know that's that's interesting, and this difference between the categories present versus past, noun versus pronoun, uh, made us interested in this evolutionary dynamics. That we could see that you know that this reconstruction showed up in the proto language, so we wanted to investigate that more carefully, and uh, <clears throat> that's actually the reason why we implemented this this coding of uh, marked and unmarked unmarked and marked. Okay. So uh, if we look at this uh, graph here that uh, shows the evolutionary dynamics, uh, then here all features are plotted according to the log gain and loss rates, which means the time spent in millennia in a specific feature before leaving it. So to make this more clear, I have added some, some boxes here. We can distinguish four types. Two unstable types but that are red here, um, of which one type is seldomly gained and frequently lost, and one is more frequently gained but also frequently lost. And then among the stable types, the green here, uh, we have features that are seldomly gained and lost, and another type that is often gained and seldomly lost. So there is a very interesting and clear pattern here, which is that Stable features, the green ones here down here, they are also reconstructed with a higher probability at the proto language state, as you can see, because the higher probability at the proto language state is marked by the size or indicated by the size of markers. And you can see that's quite clear. So, more stable, uh, more, more stable features are also more likely to be reconstructed. Uh, if we look at the different domains, there is another interesting result. First, we see that alignment is generally more unstable. They kind of cluster here in this uh, area of more unstable features, whereas nominal morphology is here down in the, in the stable uh, sector. Verbal Morphology is also basically in the stable sector, but it's a bit more unstable than nominal morphology, as you can see here. And then finally, word order. Word order is found almost everywhere. It's a little bit more uh, in the unstable part than nominal morphology. So, um, 
within this evolutionary dynamic uh, dynamics where we see that there is a difference between different types of features there is also the marked and unmarked uh, stability difference that's like really cutting through this so we see that um no we here we measure only loss rates because we're interested in how long time a feature dwells into in a specific st state before eventually leaving it and as we can see marked features that are more frequent uh, uh, sorry marked features that are uh, higher and more frequent and have a higher loss rate sorry i confused it here unmarked features that are higher and more frequent these are less uh, frequent sorry uh, have a lower loss rate and are more long lived so it's quite clear that unmarked features uh, are more stable than marked ones so a uh, summary uh, the results support the canonical model of independent grammar uh, which means a synthetic uh, language rich in categories and head final. The model reconstructs a complete and coherent system for the proto language, and traits that are reconstructed to the proto language remain stable, and change patterns are coherent within the family, and morphology changes more slowly than syntax, and unmarked features of higher frequency change more slowly than marked features of lower frequency. And interestingly enough, you know. I think that the first result here needs to be unique to Indo-European because it's reconstructing a specific system to the Indo-European proto-language. However, it's it's a fundamental question, an important question for the future uh, and uh, uh, to us is if parts of this here is possibly or partly or somehow uh, universal or general tendencies. So I will leave over to Chandra to say a few words about a possible future of this, future directions. Yes, thanks. Um, so it's always uh, tempting to see your uh, research as being the final say on an issue. And it's always, uh, you feel a little um, disappointed, uh, disappointing, disabusing uh, people of that idea. Um, so wh what we've done here is by no means the, the final word on this particular question. Uh, there are a, a number of potential research directions and it, it, it certainly is, you know, we hope that uh, this can open up uh, sort of a discourse on this particular issue that takes into account not only um, uh, informed uh, choices about uh, featural representation and uh, takes into account the sort of comparative received wisdom, but also um, cutting edge computational models that, that help to distinguish um, possibility from probability. Um, so there are a lot of ways in which uh, this research could be um, extended. Uh, one is as, as far as trees are concerned, the, the tree sample we used uh, largely incorporated what we believe to be sort of the received wisdom from the, the latest uh, comparative and uh, phylogenetic uh, work, but uh, we know for a fact that there there are a lot of um, new, new trees that are either out but are or are forthcoming, and it will be interesting to see whether our results hold um, on these new topologies. There's a there's a good chance that the many of the most uh, critical results will um, not change very much. Um, so that that is one future direction um, another is that uh, we had a fairly straightforward way of representing our data here we took the binarized um, system found in uh, diacle and we converted it to these very uh, straightforward and easy to interpret multi-state characters such as you know main clause word order is it you know, sov S svo so on and so forth um, one issue that crops up is the issue of ascertainment bias uh, as it's known and this is basically the problem that in with methods of this sort it is difficult or impossible to reconstruct features that are not attested across your data set um, and this is a source of, of criticism of, of for the application of phylogenetic comparative methods to linguistics and um, 
yes, this is true. Given given the the data representation that we used here, we we cannot reconstruct um, features not attested in our data. Uh, interestingly enough, I I think that this is at least implicitly sometimes the practice of uh, traditional reconstruction. Um, there is you know work by Roger Lass uh, advocating for realist reconstructions that you know don't uh, that avoid typological patterns not uh, not found among the daughter languages and uh, I think this is something that also implicitly comes up in all of this discussion of syntactic reconstruction carried out by you know Alice Harris and Lyle Campbell and David Lightfoot and Ian Roberts and people like that um, so I do think however that we can deal with this issue of ascertainment bias by uh, representing our data a bit differently. Um, it is possible to take a feature like word order, uh, main clause word order, and orthogonalize it into a number of independent uh, subset variables and see how those evolve independently. And then you have more hope of uh, reconstructing patterns that are not attested in your data. Um, this is essentially what the original data um, coding of Diacle does, but it also runs the risk of reconstructing logically impossible combinations of uh, variants. So this is something that I think will prove to be a fruitful domain of research in um, uh, the near future. Um, additionally, uh, we had a fairly simple model of character evolution, which was nice because it is straightforward and interpretable but there is the possibility of employing different models of character evolution. For instance, we did not take into account the possibility of rate variation across branches of the tree, a phenomenon known as heterotachy, um, because the sort of consensus about whether or not this is necessary for modeling like uh, the, the sort we carried out here is, is sort of an open question, but there is the possibility that this might yield different reconstructions. Uh, we additionally had a very interesting question in advance uh, regarding potential alternative models that we could use. I didn't have a chance to incorporate an answer to this question into our talk, but uh, perhaps we can address that in the Q&A session. So ultimately, um, we hope that we have demonstrated the uh, that this way of addressing questions of syntactic reconstruction in Indo-European is worthwhile. Um, it need not be the final say, but it is hoped that any future um, endeavors in this particular research domain take into account both the, the quantitative side of things as well as the qualitative side of things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And here is a, our final slide. Great. Right. Thank you both for for uh, for giving this webinar. It's been fascinating. Um, I do have uh, we're we're going into the Q and A session at this point. Um, I have one question in here so far. Uh, if you have any questions, attendees, please um, post them in the questions box and. We'll start addressing those. Um, I will send this one over to Chandra first. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, okay, so this question is from Alexander Krajewski. Um, hi, Alexander. I think we've been in touch uh, before. Uh, so, a question regarding the methodology. Um, uh, two somewhat related questions regarding the methodology. Um, is the uh, question one is is the method valid only as a testing procedure for well established and al already partially reconstructed language families or could it be used to inform future reconstructions uh, conducted in a more classical ma uh, manual comparative method for yet poorly studied language families um, so uh, th that is a Good question. I, I definitely would not uh, extract any sort of deterministic uh, generalizations about the, the nature of, of uh, change of individual uh, word order features in, in Indo-European 
uh, and extrapolate them to to other families just based that based on the fact that this is um, one phylogeny alone. Uh, and however, uh, if we were to start to aggregate results from not only Indo-European, but um, Sino-Tibetan and Uralic um, and other well-studied families, there, there might be reason to um, suspect that you could, you could take away some generalizations and apply them to families where, where the history is um, less well understood. Um, the, I think an important, uh, the, the, the sort of important takeaway of what we've done here, uh, which maybe is relevant to only families like Indo-European where you do have good chronological stratification of the languages um, for which data are attested is that archaic does not necessarily mean primary. Um, and uh, I don't know if this will be relevant to all families, uh, but uh, hopefully, hopefully there's some potential to inform future research. Uh, so question two is, would this method be applicable to the Trans-Eurasian language family, for instance, which has a low number of languages and a lot of uncertainty uncertainty in terms of dating the root. The, the method would definitely be applicable, but um, my guess is that you would just have a lot more uncertainty over the distributions of features at the root of the tree. Um, if you look at our, uh, our pies, uh, we usually get fairly informative distributions, but not always. And my guess is that when you have a lot more phylogenetic uncertainty, uh, you will just see um, less informative distributions. So you may not get a majority outcome and you may not be able to uh, make any kind of conclusive, conclusive inferences on, on the basis of the results of the method. Okay, hopefully I answered the question. Uh, satisfactorily, uh, not possible to see uh, my interlocutor. So I'll assume that's the case. Uh, great, thanks yeah. for the question. Alexander says, thank you for the answer and special thanks for those Iranian word lists. Oh yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have other questions from the audience? Okay. Oh, here's another one. I'll give this one to Nerd. Here we go. So Yard, I just sent a question over to you. Mm, I can't see it. Is it in the chat? It should be. Mm, I can't see it. Hmm. I'll, Maybe I'll we can read it. <laughs> okay. It is. Uh, can you talk about some of the morphological features that you see changing slowly versus the syntactic features that change more rapidly? Okay. So, um, yeah, well, let me see. Uh, well, uh, what the nominal morphology is basically is, uh, you know, um, various questions about case system, about the case system. And then, uh, so, and that's in, in this group of the slow changing features. And then we have gender, which is 
of course interesting in in relation to what uh, what Chanda already talked about. So it's quite clear that gender is a slow changer. So it doesn't change so easily. And then um, uh, the third is uh, agreement. Uh, basically, let's go back to to this um, here. Okay, so we have nominal case and pronominal case, and there are various questions asked whether is there a nominative, is there a difference between nominative, accusative, it's all, you know, all of these questions. And then we have gender and then we have definiteness, and it's it doesn't reconstruct uh, definiteness uh, to the proto-language. So it's quite clear that there is a change, but it's still uh, a slow change. So it's developing, it's emerging uh, in the in the family, and this is the same with prepositional agreement, which is found in some branches. And if we look at the the other verbal morphology, which is not not as slow as nominal morphology, it's, it's a bit more on the like fast changing. Uh, it's basically person concord in different uh, tenses. And uh, interestingly enough, we we you know we can see that there is a difference between these typological features and the more morphological features. So the typological features, which is basically if whether you use an auxiliary construction or whether you use a synthetic construction for the future and for the present progressive, so these are changing uh, more quickly than the the real morphological ones. So that just you know end up here for the sake of simplicity. But it's quite clear that the uh, everything that is related to agreement somehow is more is more stable. The change is more slowly, and this uh, and these features here that are more related to typology, which which type of construction you use, they change more quickly. So what I found interesting, however, is uh, is that alignment. Which is a bit, you know, this is a bit strange that alignment is like a quick changer because it turns out, after all, that alignment is very conservative because it's reconstructing a nominative accusative system. And that's actually found in many branches, but still alignment changes are quicker. So the main trend within the family is a change from nominative accusative to no marking. So that's the most important trend and tendency uh, from from the proto language to present day. And then we have this emergence of uh, ergativity and um, also tripartite, which is really marginal, and it occurs in some branches. And of course, the interesting is then a word order because word order seems to be like all over the all over. And the the stable ones, uh, the stable features are the ones that are reconstructed. So there are some really stable features in word order that remain the same and they they are reconstructed in proto-language and they don't change. And then there are other features that uh, apparently have, you know, changed very quickly and belong to these unstable features, uh, which is also interesting. And I think that uh, uh, at positions, non-adjective, so so the, like the, the big ones, the, the uh, main clause, word order, at positional word or the noun adjective, they are the stable ones that are also reconstructed to the proto language, and the other ones are the more unstable ones. So that's the way it's distributed here. I don't know whether that uh, responded to the question. There, there's, you know, if you sit and look at all of this in the, you know, the results and all the details, there are so many interesting aspects of why various features end up the way they do in this. Um, in this uh, in this graph, so why do some features end up in the unstable sector, and whereas others are here down in the stable sector? If you look at them individually, great. And that was by Martha Mendoza, and she says yes, thanks. You answered it great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just sent another question over to Chindra from Thomas Olander. Yes, I'm seeing a question from uh, Thomas Olander. Uh, hi, Thomas. Uh, so Thomas says, thanks for an interesting presentation. Do you have an idea about how much a different phylogeny would change your results? Let's say as a hypothetical example that Indo-Iranian 
uh, was the first branch to separate and Anatolian was more deeply embedded in the tree. Uh, interesting question. I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a forthcoming phylogeny will have uh, just such a, a configuration. And I sort of alluded to that. And I'm, I'm of course, regretting uh, that we didn't um, mess around with uh, different uh, configurations of the, the topology. I mean, our, our research question was kind of predicated on the, the Indo-Hittite you know, this, this branching of Anatolian off first and then Tocharian and then having core Indo-European uh, within there. I honestly, I don't uh, know. It is kind of the first thing I will check when a new tree comes out, but I would, I would suspect that um, things would not change considerably. I mean, an issue is essentially that um you know anatolian is is sort of the i mean minority among indo-european in a lot of ways and uh features in anatolian if i recall correctly tended to get reconstructed on, virtually only when they were also um apparent in say tocharian um and other kind of more uh basal branches of the tree. My suspicion is that having Anatolian be somewhat more deeply embedded would even uh, further sort of weaken the, the, the probability of, of seeing uh, Anatolian features be reconstructed to, to PIE. Um, and I would expect even more uh, sort of uh, uh, an even stronger probability of seeing these sort of core Indo-European features being reconstructed to the proto-language. Uh, but again, this is purely armchair uh, reasoning here. And, uh, this is something that should, should, should be done as well. Uh, it uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't a central question of our, our particular paper, but it definitely is highly relevant to the the, the general question itself. Uh, yeah, thanks for the excellent uh, question. Sorry, uh, add a few words here. So, oh, yes. okay, so, uh, so this would be like an alternative model, this one, where they all split off equally, you know, at the same time. And, uh, but I think that that would, as, as Chandra said, probably just strengthen the reconstruction that we have, because it turned out to, I assume, but we don't know, of course, before we have tested. And Thomas says, thank you for the answer. That makes sense. And I do find the tree you've used very reasonable. Um, Great. Have, That's always a relief. <laughs> I have uh, another question from Alexandra Kravsky. Um, I'll send that over to you, Chandra. Yes. OK. Um, Okay, uh, so Alexander asks, uh, why do you estimate the date of the nodes again instead of importing it directly with the topology of the phylogeny like Chang et al? That's an excellent question. Um, and uh, essentially, there is just way too much, much uh, mismatch between the languages in our sample and the languages contained in uh, Chang et al. Uh, tree. Um, so one thing you can do, and it's something that we are sort of, we do every now and then here in Zurich is we take an existing phylogenetic tree and we try to um, augment it by grafting branches on to, to certain nodes in the tree based on uh, where they appear in glottolog. There's a, there's a research assistant here who has a very nice um, script that does that. Uh, I consider doing it for this tree, but it essentially created these huge kind of uh, unwieldy looking rake-like um, configurations. And I thought that this was a more reasonable way to go about doing it. Um, there is some precedent for uh, publishing um, PCM-based papers using fixed topologies in language. Um, Done it all 2017 does it, and uh, um, some other papers have done it. It was, it was just sort of a, a choice of, of convenience um, from our perspective. 
um, essentially Chang et al used higher order clade constraints as well. So um, we would have been in a, uh, a similar position regarding how, how these higher order um, subgroupings in the tree look. And he comes back with understood. Thanks a lot. So do we have any other questions? Ah, yes, here we go. And I will field this one for you, Yard. Um, from Gregory Guy, uh, he says, can you clarify how you arrived at the timeline coding using the various sources, including um, such as archeological data? Uh, okay, so the, yeah, th that's interesting because that was, uh, you know, it's, it turned out to be not so important after all, but it was actually quite much work. So what we did was to do an estimation of the beginning and end date for all the nodes, basically. And uh, so we we compiled a file for there are two there are two files, one which contains all the all the nodes and the languages like a complete list of all the hidden nodes. And then there is another one that has a, a like a time estimation, a time stamp uh, estimation uh, with a beginning and an end. And of course it's like set at a specific date, basically a year. Uh, but these are all very rough estimations. And what we did was basically to go through all the, the literature for uh, all the different branches and uh, if I may interject, kind of I should say, I should say that large, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we, yeah. we did largely carry a lot of these over from, from Chang et al. 2015, um, which did a Yes, we a did, yes. But we procedure. did some additional work also, because I remember now that we did some additional work. And, and we, we had a file where we also added like references to, to uh, you know, to archaeological uh, datings and also, uh, you know, things about, um, because it's, it's sometimes tricky because languages are tested later than they are, were actually spoken. So uh, it's, uh, it was like a, a bit of a compilation work, like a traditional compilation work we look at books. But uh, much of it we took over also from Chang et al. That's, that's quite clear. But we adjusted I mean, it like just, just as a concrete uh, example. I mean, most scholars, you know, take the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex to be yes, sort of the staging ground for Indo-Iranian dispersal. Um, so we sort of ensured that the yep. uh, dating of Proto-Indo-Iranian would would uh, kind of coincide with the the breakup of that particular civilization, yeah. and so on and so forth. It's this kind, yeah. So I mean, all all of this is a much of a discussion. For instance, when was proto carrion spoken? You know, that's that's my area. I know a lot, but I mean, and some scholars disagree. But we we tried again to find like a consensus, not to use the the two ancient and not the the two recent dates for for proto languages. But that was more like an aid because then the model kind of. Uh, I believe adjusted much of that uh, when we did run uh, run the model for the tree for the dates of the tree. Okay. Maybe you can say something more about that, Thank Chandra. Uh, no, you you covered it all. Thanks for the uh, excellent question. Okay, and Chandra, I just sent another one over to you from Elizabeth Cannon. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, so Elizabeth says, I'm a big fan of uh, Calvert Watkins work on Indo-European cultural and lexical reconstruction. Um, if he's done work on typology, I'm unfamiliar with it. Can you tell me if you considered his work and so how it might fit in? Um, so, uh, I mean, yeah, the legacy of, uh, you know, Cal's legacy looms large over, you know, any work we do in, in Indo-European studies. Um, here, I have to say we didn't I mean, we we didn't. I mean, we we always in the back of our mind have 
his important work about you know what the limits of syntactic reconstruction are in in Proto-Indo-European. I mean, he he showed quite uh, convincingly that there are certain constructions that can be uh, pretty securely and convincingly reconstructed to Proto-Indo-European, such as the syntax of that uh, or constructions uh, relating to the giving of gifts and um, the chariot race, I believe. Is that, is that, is that true? Okay, it's been a long time since I really um, uh, read a lot of uh, these um, works in class. Um, so obviously we take, uh, we take that as sort of a, a, a positive um, uh, instruction that, you know, there is uh, the potential to, to do this kind of work, even though um, Watkins uh, view might have been a little bit more pessimistic, uh, but ultimately our model of syntactic reconstruction is, is um, more informed by linguistic work using um, computational biology. Regarding uh, Watkins' other important work on uh, poetic reconstruction and stuff like that, uh, it would certainly be interesting to see um, that submitted to phylogenetic modeling to see if you can um, uh, reconstruct uh, collocations uh, that are found in you know the old ancient Indo-European languages, but you do have to make a bit of uh, decision regarding how to represent a poetic collocation, if I recall correctly. Um, sometimes Watkins takes into account uh, etymological equivalence, but um, Every now and then, uh, he has a, com uh, a comparison that doesn't necessarily contain the same uh, cognate material, like uh, he um, compares uh, Hittite Eshar San um, and uh, Albanian uh, Yak Kirkoy, searching, looking for blood or searching for blood, and says this is a collocation, a poetic collocation inherited from the proto language, but it. Um, I don't believe the two constructions are cognate. Uh, so um, that would be a, a very interesting direction for future, future research, in my opinion. Okay, and she says, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay, I think in that case, we can go ahead and wrap up. Thank you everyone for attending and thank you so much, Yard and Chundra, for providing this presentation. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for, for organizing everything and, and putting all of this together. It definitely was a fun experience and a very rewarding one. Uh, and thanks to all who attended, even though we can't see you and can't even see who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also Friday night in Europe, at least. Yeah. Yes. And just yes, as a reminder for everyone, this will be um, this has been recorded and it will be available on the LSA website within a few days. So, thank you all for attending and have a Great. good weekend. Thanks. Thank you. Same to you. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Yep. Thank you. Or morning. <laughs> or night. <laughs> or night. I know.